FERC, in a recent order, stated it will require utilities to take at least three steps to protect physical security. First, utilities will be required to perform a risk assessment to identify facilities that, if rendered inoperable or damaged, could produce cascading blackouts or other widespread problems. Second, utilities of critical facilities will be required to evaluate potential threats and vulnerabilities to those facilities. And finally, utilities will be required to develop and implement a security plan to address potential threats and vulnerabilities. IQPC's Power Grid Resilience Conference was designed to help utilities comply with these new FERC rules and regulations. Please read the brochure for more information. We now begin a series of snapshot interviews with several of our authoritative presenters and workshop leaders. Hello and welcome to the 2014 interview series for Power Grid Resilience. I'm Larry Milburn from IQPC, and I'm fortunate enough in our first interview to be sitting here with John Wellinghoff, the immediate past chair of FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. John has the distinction of being the longest serving chairman for FERC. He is a strong advocate for renewable energy and is currently with the law firm Stoll Reeves here in San Francisco. John, you were the um, chair during last year's Metcalf incident, which is almost a year ago now, and you've been quoted as saying, that that attack keeps you up at night. So what key steps have you seen the industry take to protect the grid since then? Well, since that attack, there have been uh, a number of suggestions made to industry. I, in fact, briefed industry a year ago last summer about the attack itself and then provided them with a very specific uh, mitigation list of the things that they could do, which included uh, making the fences opaque, putting in better lighting, uh, better camera uh, and sensing equipment around the facilities. And I'm quite sure that a number of the utility companies around the country have taken that to heart. However, uh, FERC, uh, since I left, has uh, attempted to formalize that more and they've actually directed the North American Electric Reliability uh, Corporation that develops standards for electric systems including cyber and physical security standards to develop those standards <coughs> and then to deliver them to FERC so FERC can actually promulgate them as rules. So if they then became rules, those rules then could uh, be utilized to uh, enforce uh, specific requirements upon utilities of, of those utilities who might not be progressing on their own in a voluntary fashion. You obviously believe that there are some more major steps to be taken. So where do you see us going from here? Well, there are. I mean, one thing that I am concerned about is hopefully uh, the rules, once they do become enforceable by FERC, that they do focus on the most critical substations because there's not a large number of these substations, but the ones that are out there that are of the highest voltage are the most critical ones that could have the biggest effect upon taking large areas of the grid down if they were damaged or destroyed in some way by uh, some type of a, an event, uh, either a climactic event or a purposeful event like a, a terrorist act. And John, there's a lot of talk about the vulnerabilities of the grid, but what we aren't reading enough about are what the strategies are to actually overcome these problems, the how-to part. So can you talk to us a little bit about how businesses and individuals can protect themselves and put together some detailed plans for protection? Well, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. <laughs> no, actually, it, you, you really don't want to disclose in detail what your mitigation strategies are with respect to defending these facilities. Certainly, there are obvious things. Like I say, if you have a chain link fence that you can uh, you know, view with uh, optical equipment from a thousand yards away and shoot a high-powered rifle through, you want to stop the ability of somebody to be able to see that and do that. And that's a very obvious thing and you may want to put up, uh, in fact, physical barriers in front of the most critical equipment in those substations, things that they call like jersey barriers, which are um, basically concrete barriers that are movable that can be put in front of uh, 
of large pieces of equipment that could be damaged. So all those things are very obvious, but the real detailed mitigation strategies that any particular utility may engage in, you really wouldn't want to disclose that because then that gives the bad guys the roadmap of how to you know, plan around those types of things. Can you explain a little bit how big corporations and the military are looking to move to microgrids? If you have a concern about the larger grid going down because of, of potentially one of these attacks, whether it be a physical or cyber attack, especially a military base, and I served as an advisor to the Defense Science Board back in 2008 when recommendations were made from the Defense Science Board to, for the military to look at uh, microgrid issues and how they could uh, institute those kinds of facilities to improve their reliability and resilience. But, you know, also just from a standpoint uh, of uh, maintaining uh, your mission uh, as a military base, if you want to ensure that you can carry out that mission, you've got to have electricity. And if it's a long, uh, prolonged outage, uh, you can't rely simply upon uh, fuel tanks or uh, other uh, internal uh, fuel sources, you need to look at things like renewable energy. You need to look at uh, the ability to uh, island that grid for long periods of time, potentially, uh, if there could be uh, a prolonged uh, outage because of one of these attacks. And so microgrids are something that are an integral part of making the whole system more resilient because what you're doing is you're breaking it up into component parts that can island very quickly and they island fast enough so that if one part of the grid starts to go down and there's a cascading outage, that cascading outage won't travel through your, your area, whether it be a military base or whether it be a, a corporation's campus or a, or a hospital or something else, if you have a microgrid that can island from the larger grid. So it's a very essential part of ensuring that you can maintain uh, a reliable uh, system. And there's also a lot of hype in the industry right now um, on the new security standards. Uh, so the questions on everyone's mind is here that, you know, what will these new standards from FERC and NERC look like and what do you think um, they should look like? Well, I haven't read them per se. I've only read some of the press reports about them and so uh, I can only give you, you know, my anecdotal opinion from that perspective. It sounds like uh, the proposed uh, standards that have gone to FERC and FERC hasn't uh, finally enacted them yet but they're not very prescriptive. In other words, they don't have a list of, you know, you should do this, you should do that. They're more general uh, saying, you know, first the utility needs to assess what are their critical infrastructure pieces, whether or not they have uh, pieces of, uh, of infrastructure that they would deem to be critical for the rest of the grid. And then from that, they need to look at um, you know, what are uh, mitigation plans and measures they can put together. I think being less prescriptive in part is a good thing in the sense that it does allow a utility to uh, tailor their particular plan and their particular activities that they're going to engage in to ensure they can protect their facilities to their geographic area, to the uh, particular um, unique aspects of their infrastructure system that may be different, it may be in a urban, very urban area versus a very rural, rural area, and all these kinds of things are going to dictate the type of measures that you take. So uh, it, it's kind of kind of going to be one of these things that we're going to have to wait and see and see how uh, all this rolls out and ensure that uh, you know it's happening in a way that uh, really uh, can ultimately protect our systems. And, and talking about microgrids, let me go back to that just sure. one second. Uh, an example of a microgrid that was extremely useful and showed its value was the microgrid at Princeton University during Hurricane Sandy. That was a place where many of the first responders went to to charge their computers and their cell phones and to have some power and some availability to access communications to the outside to sort of coordinate the whole uh, relief efforts there because no place else around the area had power except for Princeton because they had a microgrid and they had a cogen system and they actually stood up uh, their electricity and the electric system stayed up even though the rest of the grid was completely down.
So how will these policies affect the utilities and how do you think the utilities will react and why? All utilities are different, like all people are different. So yeah. some will some will react and very positive and 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 go you know uh, you know beyond uh, where they have to go with respect to the, the standards, and some will just meet them to the to the bare letter of the law, and some of them some of them may even be in violation as we find out now with other reliability standards that don't have to do with physical security. There's always some utilities that are laggards and some utilities that are are super performers. So. Mm -hmm. It will be up to FERC to be the enforcement agency, and I think in that regard, I have a lot, a lot of confidence, a great deal of confidence, because FERC is a very effective agency in overseeing and enforcing their rules and regulations, and they have a very strong audit team, and they have a very strong compliance and enforcement team. So once these rules do get into place, once they're finally promulgated by the FERC, I have a great deal of confidence that FERC will ensure that they are followed in a way that can protect us. You're still very involved in this industry, John. Is this part of the reason why you agreed to speak at Power Grid Resilience in September? Well, in part. I mean, I am extremely interested, especially in the physical security aspects of this. And, and, and given that interest, uh, I want to ensure that we can uh, have a robust dialogue about what needs to be done and to also ensure that we are moving forward in a very positive direction to protect these critical assets that have uh, such an essential part to play in our overall economic infrastructure in this country. Great. What do you think the benefits are of having an event like this and who would you encourage to attend this well, event? Well, I, I would encourage, uh, you know, any um, a um, person within the utility industry who is in charge of these infrastructure facilities certainly to attend. I'd also uh, encourage people who are in the security industry uh, who have uh, security um, solutions that can be potentially provided to the industry to come forward because again as I understand the rules as, the, as they may go into place they're not prescriptive so it's going to give the industry uh, a level of flexibility to look at across the whole range of solutions and decide what are the most cost-effective solutions. Because ultimately, we want to protect this country. We want to protect the grid. But we want to also do it in the most cost-effective way possible. We don't want to spend, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars if only tens of millions are necessary to be spent. If there's ways to do it in a in a much less expensive way, but still get the job done, we want to get it done. And I think this conference is a good place to get those kind of people together. Great. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, we're looking forward to having you at the event in September. Yeah, I know you're going to be touring the exhibit hall. You've got a morning breakfast, and you're also presenting. So we're very much looking forward to having you. Thank you very much for your time. I'm excited about it. Thank you. You betcha. Please stay tuned for our next uh, upcoming interviews in the series on PowerGridResilience.com. And we'll see you in September in San Francisco. <laughs>